Hello, everyone. We got just about 30 seconds left here. I'm getting set up and then we'll get going. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, all right. It's one o'clock here on the East Coast on Tuesday, the 23rd of July, 2019. And my name is Paul Merrill. I'm here from Beaufort Fairmont Automated Testing Services. I'm glad you're with us today. I'm excited about this webinar. As you know, we do these every month. We have guests on every once in a while. And one of our most interesting guests so far, as determined by your signing up and registering, is Andy Knight, and so we're so glad to have him back today. He did a talk about BDD and Gherkin a couple months ago. You can find that on the Beaufort Fairmont website under the webinars. We have all the old webinars listed there and all of them recorded. You just have to register again. Sorry about that. It's not my registration page. It's GoToWebinar. Register again, and the video will come up automatically. And if you ever have any trouble with that or registering of any other kind, you can always reach out to me, paul.merrill at beaufortfairmont.com. Once again, Beaufort Fairmont is all about test automation. We eat, sleep, live, and breathe test automation. We work on problems like how do we sync up dev and testing in agile environments? How do we automate regression testing? And how do we get DevOps practices, culture, and ideas into our system, into our process? We do that through consulting, training, and our dedicated experts. And I'm happy to say we just added a couple more in the last few weeks. We're growing here at Beaufort Fairmont, and we've got more opportunities to hire more in the near future. So make sure to reach out to us about that. I'm gonna have some more information on that here in a minute. Um, before we get into this talk with Andy Knight, remember this is a free webinar, so you get a little extra stuff. You get a little bit of Beaufort Fairmont goodness, right? These are the folks on the B list. If you're new to us, I made the B list so that I could honor folks who were kind to us, who helped us out, who have been fans of Beaufort Fairmont, who have done good things. Sometimes it's as little as saying, hey, Paul, how you doing, right? Um, it's all kinds of different stuff. Some of these are, you, you never know what uh, level of help or whatever else you have been sometimes. If you see a name on there that looks like yours and we've talked recently, chances are it's you, okay? So this is the B list. Congratulations if you made it this month. And if you didn't, I look forward to you making it next month if you like us and if you want to help out in some way. So uh, thank you very much. So we have some new roles coming up. I need two to three folks like this in the Raleigh Research Triangle area. And my thinking on this is that I would love to get some folks who are new to automation, some people who maybe they've never even touched automation before, but they've got good testing instincts or they're just very analytical maybe people who are changing careers i've seen people do very well in this who came from all different fields so this is an entry level type of position for test automation if you know people like this if you know people who are responsible on top of things and they adhere to our values of respecting one another um, being honest having integrity and keeping relationships healthy make sure to send them our way the link is here, take a picture, get the slides after, watch the recording, whatever you need to. It's on the Beaufort Fairmont website. If you go under About Us and look for careers, you'll find it there. Um, don't pay as much attention to the description on that page as this one here and of what, what I've told you. So local to NC, this is contract to hire, and they've got a chance to make our team permanently here at Beaufort Fairmont if they do well in the contract and, and depending on how things go. So looking for new folks, please send them our way. Thank you so much for, uh, for a shout out on that. Upcoming, I always try to have the next events on here. What's happening next, Paul? So our next webinar is actually gonna be, it says TBD there, but it's gonna be Melissa Tondi. If you don't know Melissa, Melissa is a good name, strong name in the test automation field. She speaks at lots of different conferences within the testing and test automation industry. She's spoken at all the biggest ones, the STAR conferences, STPCon is one of her big ones. Um, she has a very strong mind, a lot of great experience with test automation. Don't miss that. I'll have more information about that very soon, but that will be on the 20th of August at 1 p.m. 
and it will still be daylight time, Eastern daylight time on the East Coast. Cast is coming up down in Cocoa Beach. If you're gonna be down there, shoot me a note, send me a tweet, do whatever, let's connect. Let's uh, make sure that we meet down there and I would love to talk test automation and your challenges with you. My talk is a little bit different this time. It's the idea of how do we create test cases? Where do our ideas come from? And the theme of Cast in general is using other fields, ideas to help us in testing. So you may or may not know, I was an English major long before computer science. And I learned a lot about coming up with new ideas in that field. So I'm going to share that and how it relates to testing in kind of a semi-session workshop um, deal down there. It's a one-hour session, but it'll be interactive. So if you're going to be down there, make sure to say hi. Make sure to come to my session. I look forward to seeing you there. You can save 10% off with the code there. STPCon, I'm excited to announce I'll be at STPCon again on the East Coast in Boston. And I'll be doing a talk about refactoring for those who don't code. So if you hear your developer saying, we just need to refactor that so that we can X, Y, and Z, this is the talk for you. Make sure to come to that if you're in the Boston area. If you're in the Boston area and you've got time to meet up around that time, give me a yell. You never know. Maybe we can get a cup of coffee. And once again, there's a way to save there. So make sure to write that down. We always do a 50 card, $50 Amazon gift card giveaway. So stick around until the end of the webinar and you may have a chance to win. It may be you and I don't know about you, but I love having an extra $50 in my Amazon account because I just haven't seen all of the Marvel movies, I guess. So today I'm excited to announce that Andy Knight is joining us for this presentation and I want to tell you a little bit about him. Andy is an engineer, consultant and international speaker who loves all things software. He specializes in building robust test automation solutions from the ground up. He currently works at Precision Lender in Cary, North Carolina, an awesome company, by the way, right up the street here. Read his tech blog at automationpanda.com and follow him on Twitter at automationpanda. And I'm going to turn on his mic here if I can figure out how to do it. Andy, are you there? Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Hey, hey welcome. I'm going to pass the ball over to you. Um, and I want to do a couple things as I'm making you the presenter. One is, I really like to know who we're talking to here. So as you're getting set up, as you're getting the presentation, being able to share your screen, I'm going to do a poll and figure out who all is on the call. So this first one is, what is your role? So you should be seeing the poll right now, folks. We've got we've got 188 people on this on this call. This is awesome. Um, go ahead and vote if you get a chance. Um, and, uh, and let's see who's who. We've got about se almost 70%, and that's usually where I cut it off. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna close off this poll here. And let me share it with you, Andy, and others. Oops. So hopefully you see on your screen right now nice. the results. And it looks like, are you able to see those, Andy? Yes, yes, thank you. So, so the, the okay. majority is testers, 37%. Lots of people in testing, so testers and automation engineers make up more than half of wow. our group here. A few managers and some other, and I would love to know what other is, but I don't know. I don't know how to find that out right now. So um, let's do one more. What do you say? Sure. All right. How much BDD have you done? And this will help Andy kind of gauge his presentation here. How much BDD have you done? And we start out with the idea of none. So the second is a little, I've seen BDD, maybe I don't work in it all the time, but I've seen it. Third option, I use it fairly often. And finally, it's, this is, hey, look, I do this all the time, right? So we got, we got a bunch of people voting there. I'm going to close that up and I'm going to share the results. And this is interesting. So 27% none, 42% mm -hmm. a little. Okay. And a few people have extensive experience with this. So I'd say they're in the right place. What do you say? Yeah, that's great. This is a good starting point. Excellent. So I'm going to hand it off to you. We'll take a break a little while, halfway through or so with questions. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Cool. Well, good luck. Thanks so much for being here. Great. Thanks for having me back. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Or are we still on the quick poll? Hmm. Oh, there we go. Cool. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm very honored to be back here, and I'm super excited to talk about writing good Gherkin as part of behavior-driven development. Oops. As Paul said, my name is Andy Knight. You may also know me as the Automation Panda. Um, 
BDD, Gherkin, testing, automation, development, these are all things I love in the software world. So our big learning objective today is that we want to learn how to write good Gherkin, right? Gherkin is fairly easy to write, but doing it well can be tricky. And we want to do it well so that we can improve our team's collaboration and test automation. Today's webinar will be a bit of a deep dive, and we're going to look at four key rules in addition to some Gherkin syntax for how to write good Gherkin. As Paul mentioned, we'll be stopping halfway through as well at the end for some Q&A. And also, as Paul mentioned before, in a previous webinar, we had covered behavior-driven development as a process. As a quick recap, BDD, or behavior-driven development, is a software development process that puts behaviors first. The idea of a behavior is kind of like a feature function. It's the way something operates or behaves. And it's those behaviors that ultimately deliver business value for the software that we develop. BDD can be seen as a collection of practices that can complement existing software processes like Agile. For example, uh, the three amigos, such as the developer, the tester, and the product owner, can come together as a meeting of the minds to plan things, discuss features, and really get on the same page together. Another BDD activity is example mapping, where you take user stories and you come up with rules and examples and questions for them during planning so that you know exactly what a story is, how it should be scoped, and how you can specify it well. Today, we're gonna to look specifically at behavior specification with the Gherkin language. That's that box in green there. And we're gonna deep dive into that and how we write good Gherkin and good feature files. Also, another part of BDD is ultimately the behavior implementation. Planning is good, but it has to result in something. So implementation would refer to the code for both the product as well as the test automation. I've put the links to the previous webinar here, as well as the previous Q&A uh, with all the questions and answers on my blog. So feel free to check those out when you get a chance. So let's go deep into Gherkin now. What is Gherkin? Uh, I've been throwing this around as, as a buzzword, but when I say Gherkin, what I'm referring to is a simple language for specifying behaviors. It comes from the Cucumber project and many other BDD frameworks and projects have adopted it. And ultimately, Gherkin has a three-pronged syntax. It, we write our behaviors as given, when, then scenarios. Given steps set up an initial state. They're like a prep function or a setup. The when steps are what will initiate actions for our behaviors. Those could be things like selecting an option from a dropdown or clicking a button or navigating to a page. It's the thing where an actor is interacting with the product or feature under test. And finally, the third part are the then steps. Thens are like assertions. They verify the outcomes. What should have happened with our behavior? What do we expect? And we'll write our Gherkin scenarios in what we call feature files. They're basically text files that end in .feature, but you may hear me refer to Gherkin scenarios as being saved in feature files, and that's all I mean by that. So let's take a look at some Gherkin. Here is an example feature file. Everything I'm showing here is correct Gherkin syntax. You'll notice at the top, underlined in purple, we have a feature section. Every feature file should have one feature section with a title that describes what the feature should be. In this case here, I have a shopping cart feature. Immediately under the feature title, we have some lines for documentation. These are purely for the reader. They're not used by any automation framework or anything. And as a best practice, I often recommend putting the user story for this feature here. So our user story, and in this case is, as a shopper, I want to put items to buy in a cart so that I can hold them while shopping. User stories are truly business value propositions for the things we want to become true in these software products and features. Within the feature section, you can have one-to-many 
scenario sections. And you can even see that they're indented to show that they're under that feature. This example has one scenario, add items to the cart. And we see our given when then format at play. Given the cart has five items, when eight items are added to the carts, then the cart contains 13 items. Here you can see we've set up our initial state by saying our cart has something in it. We've taken an action by adding items to our carts, and then we're making sure that the total number of items is what we expect because five plus eight is 13. Some other things to note about Gherkin syntax. Uh, you'll notice those comment lines in green on the right side. You can add comments anywhere in Gherkin uh, with the hashtag symbol and anything after that hashtag will be commented out. You may also see these at sign tokens in light blue on top of the feature section and the scenario section. Those are tags and we can use those for organization and filtering. So you may be wondering, why would I write my behaviors and my test cases in Gherkin? What is it about this special syntax that makes it so much better than say writing a wiki page or just writing a bullet list or paragraphs? There are quite a few advantages to writing in Gherkin. First of all, with a feature file, you have a singular artifact of your software development process that represents the requirements, the acceptance criteria, and the test cases for that behavior. It's all wrapped in one. That's really nice. Furthermore, when you formalize your behavior specs in a language like Gherkin with its keywords and its light amount of formatting, those feature files can be automated using a test framework. Basically, that feature file can become a test script directly. And that's really nice. You don't have to read a, a description of a test case and then try to figure out how the automation fits into it, right? That feature file is part of your test code. Also, these feature files give clear, unambiguous examples for how the behavior should work. Right? That's why we call it specification by example. That's why we use numbers like 5 and 8 and 13, because people will typically understand concrete examples better than abstractions. And we want to make things clear, and we want to make things concise, because that will help our whole team develop the right things. And finally, these, these feature files are a sense of accountability, because they act like a receipt or a proof of purchase for what the team had originally planned, right? The in, when, when deciding what features to develop, going through example mapping, and then writing these feature files, right? The team is saying, this is what we want. And just to cap it all off, Gherkin is written in plain language. It's not a programming language. It is a specification language. Anyone can write Gherkin. You don't need to be a developer. You don't need to know Java or Python or C Sharp, right? Anyone on a team, whether they're a product owner, developer, or tester, can come together and help specify what the behavior should be in this easy to use syntax. As I mentioned before, these feature files can be used for test automation directly. And there are a number of popular BDD frameworks out there that can use Gherkin. Uh, one of the more popular ones everyone's probably heard of is Cucumber, originally in Ruby, but now popularly in Java and JavaScript. Some others include Specflow and C Sharp. That's what I use day to day. I love it. Uh, Python, I use these regularly as well, such as PyTest BDD and Behave. Um, but most of these popular BDD frameworks use some variant of the Gherkin language, maybe with a few twists on the Gherkin syntax. But overall, Gherkin is fairly standardized across everything. Now, I've made it seem like Gherkin is actually pretty easy. And just writing given, when, and then, and some English behind it can be an easy entry point. But while writing Gherkin can be easy, writing good Gherkin can be very hard. There is 
an art to it. There is a knack to it. There is a learning curve because we don't just want to write scenarios once and forget them. We want them to be scalable. We want these steps to be reusable. And so we want to make sure that we write good Gherkin so that it can last for a long time and be useful. So let's learn four helpful rules together for writing good Gherkin. The first rule is what I like to call Gherkin's golden rule. Treat other readers as you would want to be treated. Write your feature files so that everyone can intuitively understand them. Write your feature files so that everyone can understand them. If we're trying to sell the value proposition that Gherkin is easy for everyone to pick up and run with, make sure you're being friendly to, to the next person who's going to pick it up and read it. Let's look how this plays out. Here on the screen, I have two extremes of how we could write our Gherkin scenarios. On the left, we have an ultra declarative scenario. Shoes. Given I want shoes, when I buy shoes, then I get them. Contrast that to what we have on the right, the ultra imperative scenario. I'm not even going to read this because the font is too small and it keeps going off the screen. But we can clearly see visually we have two very, very different styles for writing Gherkin scenarios. And each of these extremes has problems. Looking at the ultra declarative scenario first, we can look at each one of these steps and show some of the major problems that this scenario has. Right off the bat, we can see this scenario is not really procedural, right? When I write these behavior scenarios, I really want them to be a step-by-step -step process, right? Because that's how we exemplify the behavior at play. Behaviors represent interactions, and so I, I need to see some sort of interaction with the thing I'm developing. Here, namely in this given step, we see I want shoes. This is not an actionable step. This is not a setup step. Instead, this is more of a, a business proposition statement, right? This sort of thing would belong more in a user story than in a Gherkin scenario. So keep that in mind. There's a difference between user stories and Gherkin scenarios. And we, we wanna make sure that our scenarios are procedural. Secondly, we also see that the scenario is very vague. This when step really begs the question, what? <laughs> what? What is the behavior here? What is the feature under test? Um, how, how do I go about buying these shoes? This is very ethereal. Are we talking about a web app? Are we talking about a mobile app? Are we talking about like a, a process in a store or back? We just don't know. All we know is that a customer wants to buy shoes, but we haven't specified any mechanism for them to buy those shoes. The feature is essentially missing. And as a result, this behavior is ambiguous. If uh, as a developer, I were to receive this, I wouldn't know what to develop. I wouldn't know what to implement. As a tester, if, if I were handed this, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I'd have to go back and talk to the product owner and the developer to say what's going on here. So we, the, the point of specification is to eliminate that ambiguity, is to bring clarity and eschew vagueness. The third problem here is that the scenario is also not verifiable. This then step says, I get the shoes or I get them. There's really no good way to, to have any sort of assertion. There's, there's really no check for the rules here, right? What does it mean that I receive the shoes? Are they in my shopping cart? Do I, uh, do I have them in another place? Uh, is there some sort of transaction for which I have a receipt or a record? There's nothing really being verified here. And as a result, this scenario really lacks accountability. Even if I were to run it, I'm not validating the rules of this user story. I'm not sure that I could meet the acceptance criteria. And that's a problem. Let's swing the pendulum to the other extreme now. Let's look at the ultra imperative case. This scenario, I don't even know how many lines are here. I've lost track. I'm not going to count right now. <laughs> but it's the same basic thing, purchasing shoes through an app. 
And if we were to step through the steps here, we see things like username and login, we see clicks, we see waiting, we see um, more clicks and more waiting. But if you take a step back and kind of squint your eyes a little bit, um, you'll see the proverbial wall of text, right? This is an anti-pattern anytime you write something. When you have a wall of text, you it's, it's really hard to get meaning and understanding out of it because you, you, you feel intimidated, there's a lot of information there, and you can miss the forest for the trees. In this scenario, the desired behavior is obfuscated because there are too many low level and really somewhat unimportant steps, right? If you were to write this, you may understand exactly how the scenario works when you write it. But now imagine handing this off to another person and trying to explain the same behavior. Are other people intuitively going to understand the behavior you're trying to cover with the scenario? And the likely answer is probably not, if they even bother to read the whole thing because it's a wall of text. <laughs> so that is the, the, one of the big problems in this one. A second problem here is that we have a lot of low level interactions. If you scan through, there are multiple clicks and multiple waits. They're prob if this is a web app, that's probably underneath the hood just doing low level Selenium web driver calls. The problem with having these types of calls, these mechanical calls at the Gherkin level is they communicate how, but not so much what or why. They don't give us a context for the business value. They don't reveal the business value of the behavior to us. And that's why it's hard to understand. And that's why we could miss the forest for the trees. What is this? What does this scenario really do here? Right? It does. I mean, yes, the clicks and all are part of that, but that should really be an automation detail, not a behavior specification detail. Finally, the remaining problem we have with this scenario is that we have repeated when then pairs, which means we are covering multiple behaviors and therefore we don't have a separation of concerns. The scenario is probably doing too much or it's it has too much specification at too fine of a detail, thus leading to some of the other problems. So let's bridge the gap between these two extremes. What we really, really want is a nice, concise, declarative scenario that highlights the business value while providing the procedure for enacting this behavior. Here I have a four line scenario, adding shoes to the shopping cart. Given the shoe store homepage is displayed, when, shoppers, when the shopper searches for red pumps and the shopper adds the first result to the cart, then the cart has one pair of red pumps. Very basic behavior but we've covered it fully. It's declarative. It shows what we want. On this web page, I'm searching for a particular type of shoes. I'm adding it to my cart and it's there and I'm making sure it's there. We're also following strict step order. We always want to go givens, then whens, and then thens. Setup, action, verification, or arrange, act, assert. If you start to change that step order, you're no longer specifying behaviors. <laughs> Always keep strict step order. And make sure your steps are concise. Say what you need to say. Typically, I recommend people try to keep to single digit length for scenarios so that we avoid that wall of text. And if you feel like your scenario needs to have more steps, I'd recommend check yourself before you wreck yourself. Right? Do you need to be more declarative? Are you covering more than one behavior and need to split? Keep that in the back of your mind as, as a, a guidepost. We also wrote, wrote these steps chronologically so that they can be automated by say Cucumber or SpecFlow or Behave. And we avoided low level interactions. What matters for this behavior? What matters is that a shopper did some searching and added it to their cart. Does it matter precisely what button they clicked? Not so much. The automation can handle those details. But what we want to see at the top level is that someone is doing searching successfully. And finally, we also want to respect our step types, right? Don't mislabel whens and thens as givens 
just to preserve a given when then ordering, right? We want to make sure we frame our behavior well. So uh, we're about halfway through and I'm ready to take some questions and answers if anybody has something. Hey, so Andy, as you remember, it takes a little while for people to type in their answers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll raise their hand if they don't mind being in front of about 220 or more people here. But uh, if folks raise their hand, I'll, I'll be happy to take them off a of mute. Um, here's one that's raising their hand. Let's try Claude. I'm gonna take them off of mute. Claude, are you there? Yes, I am. Good afternoon. Um, so a little bit um, about my background. I was a test engineer uh, for about seven years and now I'm a systems analyst. And um, because we're using um, Gherkin in an enterprise uh, scenario, um, there's a lot of um, work and, and angst on trying to get the statements at the right resolution, especially as they're passed downstream uh, for testing. Um, from an analyst perspective, what recommendations um, do you personally have for making sure that um, not only we're writing good Gherkin, but also making sure that we're focusing on the testability aspect uh, of the statements as well? Well, that's great. That is a great question. And that's one that a lot of teams, especially at enterprise level, I've seen struggle with. So the, the, the first advice I can say is make sure you have those three amigos, those three different roles, collaborating on what the behavior should be and possibly also writing Gherkin together even. Because what I find is that teams will, will right size their Gherkin for their needs, right? Some teams are you know, in, in the web application space and it's all driven through web UI. But other teams, they may be more on the back end, and so they have other concerns they have to handle. Um, Regardless of the product or features under test, whether there's some flashy front end thing, a back end thing, or even like a, a, a systems process type thing, um, still following some of the rules and guidelines I just mentioned, you know, keeping things concise, keeping things, you know, single digit in length. Um, sometimes people want to add more description and that can help as kind of like a, a railing. I would recommend possibly putting comments in place if you if something seems a little fuzzy or refactoring some of the, the, the step verbiage you use. Um, and really, a lot of it comes down to practice, right? A lot of times people, when they first start writing Gherkin, and they hit writer's block and they're like, well, I'm not sure at what level I should be writing this Gherkin. I'm not sure if I should be you know, talking about you know, specific web elements on the page or if I should be talking about specific REST API endpoints. And what I would say is try it and see for your team, right? Just write some stuff out in a brainstorming session, look at it, hold it up, and you try some of those checks. Does this pass the wall of text check? Does this pass the single length, uh, um, single digit length test, right? Um, is this chronological? Uh, does this make sense when I hand it to somebody else who may be down the hall and wasn't part of our little brainstorming session? Right, and you'll find as you collaborate and as you iterate, your Gherkin's gonna get better as you go. That's great, so we have a bunch of questions now and I'm gonna do one more and then we're gonna keep going. Oh boy. Um, but keep sending in those questions, folks, and we'll have another uh, time for Q&A at the end. Is that right, Andy? Yes, yes. Cool, so here's one that asks about your example specifically. So you may wanna go back to that, but this individual says, isn't searching and adding a cart two different behaviors. Why did we add them to the same scenario using two wins? Ooh, that's an excellent question. Searching versus adding could be considered separate behaviors. That's absolutely true. Um, what I was covering in this particular example here, this particular scenario, was kind of like the user process of, all right, so I want to, I want to, add the shoes I want to my cart. And in order to get them to the point where I add, let me just do a simple search as one of my action steps and then search, add, boom. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. That um, What am I trying to say here? I wouldn't get too hung up over the, the case of this example, right? If I actually had a shoe store web app 
and now we're trying to write dozens of these scenarios to aptly cover behavior, um, then that question would be more pertinent, right? I might say, hey, oh shoot, you know, this scenario, maybe it is covering two separate behaviors because searching and adding to the cart may be a little more complicated than I imagined them to be at first. And if that were the case, then yes, maybe I might go and separate them out. Um, but I would still say for the sake of this example, this is not a bad scenario because the, the thrust of this scenario is the, the idea of basic user, quick search, find something, like it, add to cart. And I could I can argue that that, that path is, is one behavior in the system from a user's perspective. That's but perfect. We've got a bunch question. of other we've got a, a bunch of other good questions here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hold them till the end. But um, thanks so much, and let's continue. Cool. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, I love these questions. They they show you're thinking things. <laughs> cool. So let's continue. Oops. Come on. There we go. Awesome. So the second rule I want to cover is what I call the cardinal rule of BDD, and it actually hits on that second question that was just asked. The Cardinal Rule of BDD states, one scenario should cover exactly one individual independent behavior. One scenario to one behavior. The Cardinal Rule will bring us a lot of benefits when it comes to BDD and it comes to specifying these behaviors. When we focus on one behavior at a time, we get all these good things. When it comes to collaboration, when we focus on one thing at a time, there's less confusion, there's less complication, right? We, we can all be on the same page with discussing the same thing and knock it out a lot faster. In terms of automation, when we take these feature files um, and we take them as test cases and write the step definitions whenever BDD framework, and then we run them say in continuous integration. When every scenario points to one behavior, then we also know that each test failure will point to a unique problem. Our triage time is gonna be much faster, right? We don't have to step through the trace deeply of a test to figure out exactly where something went wrong. We know from the title of the scenario, this is the behavior that failed. This is the place where the problem is. And we don't have to worry about that being a misnomer for a different problem. In terms of efficiency, Focusing on one thing at a time means that each individual work item is inherently less complex. And that will lead us as a team to faster cycle times, right? We can get through implementing the behavior. We can get through implementing the automation. It's more streamlined, more sensible, less complex, and therefore we can move a lot faster as a team. And that's really nice. We also have improved traceability. We can tie a direct line from inspiration down to implementation. How so? Well, if we have one behavior, we have one example for that behavior, which means one Gherkin scenario, which means one test case, which then when it comes to running that test means one test results and possibly one failure with one root cause. We'll know exactly how that traced through our entire process. That's really nice to have. And finally, we also have better accountability. We don't have this huge wall of text. We don't obfuscate our behaviors. We don't sidestep or avoid behaviors. We know exactly what we are developing. We know exactly what we're testing. It's completely transparent and we can be true to our intentions. So let's take a look at a scenario here. Uh, basic product search again. Given the shoe store homepage is displayed, when the search phrase red pumps is entered, uh, in case anybody's wondering, this is what a pair of red pumps looks like. I had to go look this up myself. <laughs> when the search phrase red pumps is entered, then results for red pumps are shown. When the user searches for images from the results page, then the image results for red pumps are shown. Here's a question. How many behaviors are covered by this scenario? Two. Uh-oh, we have a problem. This scenario covers two behaviors. It's very easy to pick that out because we have duplicate when-then pairs, right? I repeat action and verification and action and verification again, right? We don't want to have this 
because if I were to run this as a test and the first search fails, there's no way I'm even going to get to the, the images. And when I'm talking about a simple product search in the title there, there's nothing indicating there's anything to do with an image search as well. So that can lead to some ambiguity and some possibly wonky things going on. What would be much preferable is to separate these behaviors out into two scenarios. Now, there's a trick here because we need to do an initial search before we can get to the results page and then click that image search link. So how do we separate these out? Not as tricky as you might think. Here I've written two scenarios. The first one covers the simple web search. Given the shoe store homepage is displayed, when I do my search, then the basic results are shown. The second scenario is where things become a little more interesting. This scenario is called simple web image search. Notice my given step here is phrased rather interestingly. Given shoe store search results for red pumps are displayed. As you recall, our given step sets up an initial state, right? The initial state doesn't always need to be the login page or the home page. We can start our scenarios in media res, in the middle of the action. So what's the middle of the action here? Well, I, I want my starting point to be, I'm already at a search results page because I want to start on the search results page and hit the button to make it into an image result. So that's how I specified my given step. And my whens and thens are gonna be the same. I have two scenarios now so that I'm covering these behaviors separately. In the case where a simple web search is working, but an image search is not, I'll have the first scenario passing and the second scenario failing, thus leading to what I said before about greater traceability and greater accountability and failures pointing to exactly one problem. In the previous scenario, there was one scenario that would have failed, but I wouldn't have known which of those two behaviors was actually the culprit without doing some deeper digging. Our next rule is what I call the unique example rule. Don't include unnecessary examples. Focus on unique input equivalence classes. Focus on equivalence classes. Now, you may not be familiar with this term equivalence classes, but we'll talk about it. So here's another example. In this case, my feature file has a scenario outline. Now, if you're familiar with Gherkin, you probably already know what this is. But as a quick recap, scenario outlines are just like any other scenarios, with the catch that they are essentially scenario templates. They include an examples table with sets of input rows. And the example, every row in the examples table will be substituted into steps in the scenario outline. So you can have somewhat of data-driven testing with these scenario outlines. It's a way to really stretch what one scenario can do without a lot of copy-paste redundancy. So here in this scenario outline, I've got my basic product search again. You start at your shoe store page, you search for something, you verify results. But this time, instead of hard coding the type of shoes, I am substituting multiple different types of shoes as my search phrase. I have seven rows in my examples table. So if I were to automate and run this test, there would essentially be seven tests executed for this one scenario outline. But here's the, the kicker. Are all of these examples really necessary? Right? Let's take a look at what these examples are. They're all just different types of shoes, red pumps, sneakers, sandals, flip-flops, flats, slippers, and running shoes, right? And all this behavior is checking is that a basic search works, meaning you type in something and you get something out. We're not testing any sorts of filtering. We're not checking to make sure the images are necessarily correct. It's just a basic, I put it in, I got something basic out. So are all these examples necessary? I would argue probably not, right? Each of these different types of shoes doesn't really add much additional value. 
And that's what we mean by equivalence classes, right? An equivalence class is a set of inputs that all yield roughly the same kind of outputs, right? Is it really that much different to search for flip-flops versus sandals? In our case, probably not. Maybe there's a little tiny bit of a difference, but is, is it worth taking that extra execution time to get it? That may not be worth the case. Does it add extra understanding for the example of this behavior? I can kind of understand this example without needing multiple types to, to explain it to me. I, I, I get it. So anytime we have inputs that are of the same equivalence class, we truly ought to remove those duplicates, right? They don't add value for our understanding. They don't genuinely increase our test coverage, and they also waste test execution time. This is especially bad for certain domains like web UI testing or mobile testing, where the typical test case can take about a minute. Now, if you think about that in terms of execution time here, with one, with one example in my table, this test would take one minute. If I had all of these, it would take seven minutes. Now, in the industry, it's very, very common to have test suites that are hundreds to thousands of test cases large. So we're talking hundreds to thousands of extra minutes of testing. That's a lot of compute resource. And that's a lot of money, and that's a lot of time wasted getting to delivery. So be mindful of that. Always look for equivalence classes that you can remove. And be careful, because when, it, when you specify in the Gherkin here, it's very, very easy just to add extra rows and columns to examples tables without thinking of the consequence. So do simplification by example. <laughs> Finally, our fourth rule is what I like to call the, the fourth amigo rule. Pretend that your high school English teacher is the fourth amigo reading your gherkin. Pretend that your high school English teacher is reading your gherkin. Now, if you're like me, you may have entered software and tech and computer science to get away from English, <laughs> but English still matters and proper English matters right? We want our behavior scenarios to be readable and expressive. And we also need our steps to be reusable. If we don't use good language in, in our Gherkin, then it's going to be very, very tough to reuse steps. In fact, they may become incompatible. Um, it can also be very hard to, to communicate and to understand the behaviors when there's poor grammar or misspellings or inconsistent phrases, right? All that sort of bad English can really ruin the benefits we seek from this type of behavior specification. It can make things confusing, and it could also lead to steps being used improperly. So using good grammar, using good spelling, using good phrasing is very, very, very important. All those things we learn from our high school English classes come back to help us here in terms of how to write well. And let's see a couple ways in how this comes out. First of all, we need to decide a point of view for how to write our scenarios. Here I have our basic shoe store searching scenario written in two ways, in first person as well as in third person. On the right or on the left, first person. Given I am at the shoe store homepage, when I enter red pumps into the search bar, then I see links related to red pumps on the results page. I, me, my, all first person, all putting myself as the narrator, as the initiator of the action in this scenario. Contrast that to what third person looks like. Given the shoe store homepage is displayed, when the user searches for red pumps, then links related to red pumps are shown on the results page, right? The same behavior is covered. It's just we're stating our steps in slightly different ways based on first person or third person. So the question is, which one is better? How should I be doing this? Now, opinions rage on this, and there are people out there who will side one or the other. My opinion is strongly that third person perspective is better. And the reason why is because first person can be ambiguous. Who am I? Am I 
a regular user? Am I an administrator? Am I some sort of other system or process? Uh, what happens when I have two users on the system at the same time? First person can be kind of limited and you have to do the hokey pokey to make the, the steps work with it. Whereas on the other hand, third person perspective can expressively name any user or system component. It is objective, formal, and unambiguous, and thereby it's also more powerful. So I strongly, strongly recommend using third person over first person. Now, I can respect folks who want to use first person as well, because there are advantages to that. But at the end of the day, all steps must use the same points of view, whether it's first or third. If you mix steps with perspective, you get ugliness and confusion, like with this scenario. Given I am at the shoe store homepage, when the user searches for red pumps, then I see web page links for red pumps. So time out, am I the user? Is there another interloper coming in to do searching for me? This scenario doesn't specify that. It's ambiguous, it's unclear. So remember, steps may be shared between scenarios, especially when it comes to automation. Stick with one point of view, and I strongly recommend that to be third person. Another Englishy thing to pay attention to are subject predicate phrases. All steps should use subject predicate phrases. You have the starter noun, you have the verb, and maybe a direct object or a prepositional phrase. Consider this scenario here at the right. I've covered up the first couple steps, but I've left a few steps at the bottom and image links for sneakers and video links for sneakers. These steps are not subject predicate phrases. They might be subjects, they might be direct objects. We don't know. What exactly are these steps supposed to be doing? Should we be verifying that these image links and video links appear on the page? Should we be clicking them? The steps in and of themselves don't give us the proper context, and that's because they're not written as subject predicate phrases. Let's rewrite them. Now we have, and the results page shows image links for sneakers. Now we can see that these steps are clear. We are trying to verify that they appear on a particular page. And when I see these steps now and know what they are based on their context, I'm more likely to reuse them in other scenarios, which will help out tremendously for future testing. If we remove the entire covering, no surprise again, it's our basic searching scenario, just in a different format. Subject predicate phrases really help to capture the context for steps. The scenarios will also provide context. If I had shown you the entire scenario at first, but with the original versions of those then steps, you would have read it and understood the scenario and what the steps are trying to do. However, if I were to take away the context of that scenario, the steps are now not as meaningful. And imagine if I were to go write another scenario and misuse those steps. That would cause all sorts of problems for understandability, collaboration, and automation. Each step must make sense in its own right. Each step must make sense in its own context. So make sure when you write these steps, you're being specific about what the thing is, where it is, what should be happening with it, all the pertinent details. So I've dumped a lot of information on y'all. Let's tie it together. We've learned a lot today. Primarily, we've learned that anyone can write good Gherkin. Anybody can use Gherkin. It's a plain language or a, it's, it's plain language syntax. It's meant to be accessible for everyone. And we also know that these Gherkin scenarios have the added benefit because they can be automated as tests as well. They serve to be requirements acceptance criteria, and test cases as one artifact. We also looked at four rules for good Gherkin. First of all being Gherkin's golden rule, treat other readers as you want to be treated, write your scenarios so everyone can understand them. Rule number two, the cardinal rule, one scenario should have one behavior. Rule number three, the unique example rule, 
focus on equivalence classes. Don't add needless examples. And finally, number four, the fourth amigo rule. Pretend like your high school English teacher reads your gherkin. Follow good writing practices. So before we get to questions, I just want to share a few more resources with you. There's more about this topic than I can cover in a one hour webinar. So uh, please check out my blog at automationpanda.com. I've written a lot about BDD, Gherkin, Good Gherkin, Test Automation, all the above. So I'd love to see you come visit there. A couple other websites I recommend. If you haven't seen it already, check out Test Automation University. There are free online courses with videos, transcripts, and quizzes. Um, their stuff is almost all about test automation, but you also get other topics like test strategy, maybe some BDD, maybe some deeper technology stuff. It's, it's, it's amazing. I love Test Automation University. Uh, the Cucumber website and Spec Solutions website also have good information about BDD. And the following books I also recommend, BDD in Action, as well as the Cucumber book. So with that, uh, I, that's the conclusion of my slides, and we can move on to other things. <laughs> hey, Andy, that was wonderful. I really appreciate it. This is great. And uh, by the way, um, plus 100 for using subject predicate properly within a tech webinar. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good work. Nobody had that on their buzzword bingo, so you win. <laughs> You um, we have a couple other questions here, and I'm having trouble getting the screen back over to me. So if you can make me the presenter or do something to help me out there, that would be great. Okay, uh, uh, stop showing screen. Do that on my side as well, but it looks like I'm having trouble. Okay. Maybe I can do it this way. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, so there was, there we go. Thank you very much. No problem. Let's see if this works. Hopefully you guys are seeing the slides. Great. So a couple questions before we close this up. So one was from Jefferson. I really liked uh, this one. How do you handle setting up a very low level scenario without having a wall of text and keep the good gherkin precise? Ooh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, without knowing the domain of what that low level thing is, it's a little hard to answer. But one thing I'll often do particularly if I'm writing Gherkin as part of test automation. I like to handle a lot of low-level setup, such as, let's say, launching Selenium WebDriver or something, uh, in test automation hooks. I know we didn't really talk about that too much in this webinar, but all the BDD frameworks can have logic inserted before a scenario or after a scenario. All the details that aren't really pertinent at the test case level, but are very pertinent for setting up test automation. That should be handled at the automation layer and hooks are a great way to handle that. Awesome, awesome. So we're running out of time. I wanna be respectful of people's times. I know that many people have meetings or whatever at two o'clock uh, here in just a minute. A couple things I wanna mention before we get into who's gonna win the Amazon gift card. Number one, um, Andy will be at Pi Ohio this weekend uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Is that right, Andy? Correct. And this is a Python conference in Columbus, Ohio. I hope I've got that right. Yes. And it's free. I don't know if their tickets are still being sold, but if you're in the Columbus area and you want to see Andy or you want to get involved more with Python, that sounds like a great place to go. Um, I want to talk about a couple other things. We're currently going through a really great project with one of our clients in uh, who's, who's moving over to doing more automation with this type of thing, BDD, acceptance test driven development. It's going really well. I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit more of that in a case study soon. Um, but all of this information we have here are things that we go through with our clients and that we help our clients with either through consultations or training or using our people, our dedicated experts. So keep that in mind as you go from here. Um, also, we have a two-day BDD class. We come into your office place. We work with your people to learn about BDD. Make sure to reach out to me, Paul Merrill, about that or go to the website, ask us about it. There's more information there. So without further ado, let's figure out who's going to win this. And I believe I have a drum roll here, Andy. There it is. This drum roll works. And the winner is Natalia B. So if Natalia is your name and your last name starts with a B, you have just won the $50 Amazon gift card. Congratulations. Um, I'm happy for you, excited for you, and I hope you enjoy the gift card from Beaufort Fairmont. Get BDD. Get Good Gherkin. Call us today. Here's my contact information. Reach out to us on Beaufort Fairmont. We'd be happy 
to help out with what you're doing. Thank you so much for your time today, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on the 20th of August for Melissa Tondi. Thank you so much and have a good day. Bye-bye.